Boulevard. Um, this is also a movie like Gilda, um, where I don't, I barely care. I, I, it's, I, I like the first, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of the movie, but like this movie does not get started until we meet Norma Desmond, just like Gilda does not get started until we meet Gilda. Uh, and Norma Desmond is one of the greatest characters in film history, and she's completely rad. Before we get to her, though, um, I want to mention something. Um, and in a lot of the movies that we watch, one of the things that I really admire, especially 2001 is the best example of this. It just shows you stuff. And it lets you make up your own mind. Normally, I hate movies that have a lot of narration in them. Um, because it, when a character narrates it for the audience, it's like they think I'm too stupid to figure it out on my own. Um, I often feel insulted by narration, which is just telling me things that if I just watch the movie, I could probably figure out on my own. And also, there's got to be a better way to explain things to me, to let me – we've talked about this, but there's ways of learning things. That are there's a, there's a better way to teach audience things than just having a guy in their narrations go. I watched Enola Holmes, which is a really bad movie, um, and, and the the opening of the movie goes. There are four things you need to know. First, blah 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 blah. Second, blah 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 blah. And it's like it's just it's not a book. Like it's I don't need you. Don't explain all of this to me. There's got to be a better way to let me know about the world of the movie and the relationships between the characters than just telling me, right? Let me see how people interact, and I'll, I'm smart. I'll figure it out. Um, and the movies that we watch are smart. They let you figure things out about the characters by noticing little details about them. Um, so normally I hate voiceover narration, but Sunset Boulevard is an exception. Um, I actually, and, and Double Indemnity is too. Double Indemnity I make an exception because the dialogue, the talking is so funny. I, I enjoy the, the script is so clever, uh, right? Neff, two Fs is in Philadelphia. That's funny. I like that. Um, but I make an exception for Sunset Boulevard, both Billy Wilder movies, by the way. I make an exception for Sunset Boulevard here, too, because Joe Gillis is a writer, and he's a smart writer. And the narration it allows us to hear his words, and that's important because it lets me know what kind of a writer Joe Gillis is. Without the narration, I wouldn't know if his books would be any good if he, if he wrote a book or his screenplay. Because I'm not going to like read a screenplay of Joe Gillis's before I watch the movie. He's not a real person. And it would be ridiculous if they had me read a book at the beginning of the movie. Um, but with his narration, I get a feel for what kind of writer he is. And so, for example, when he walks up to Norma Desmond's house, he says it, it reminds him of Miss Haversham. Now, I'm sure a lot of you guys don't know who Miss Haversham is, but she's a character from a Charles Dickens novel. Um, she's an old lady who was supposed to get married and didn't get married, and she's just old and bitter about it for her entire life. And she's an old lady who never got over it, and she lives in this dilapidated mansion. Um, but it's a, the fact that he even knows who that is um, tells you that he's the kind of person who reads, who cares about literature, who cares about art. Um, and he's an artist himself. He looks out over her tennis court and he says, oh, there was a tennis court, or maybe the ghost of a tennis court, because nobody uses it anymore. Um, but it's still sort of there. The tennis court or the ghost of a tennis court, that tells me what kind of writer he is. I like it. I actually think that's quite good writing. And several times in the movie, um, you you get the you, you get a sense from his narration of what kind of a good writer he would be. So that's one thing. That's I know I, I know I often like movies where they don't just explain everything to you. David Lynch, of course, when you finish some of these movies, you're like Jesus. I wish they would explain that a little bit better. But I like that because it means they're like you can figure it out. Not necessarily right now. Maybe later. Maybe a year from now you'll figure it out or think about it more. And I, I like that. But in this case, I, I also like the narration in Sunset Boulevard. It's a special exception to my normal rule of hating movies that explain too much to me. Um, if you want to see an example of this, by the way, um, I think I mentioned this already, but Interstellar is very similar to 2001, except they fucking explain everything and it ruins the whole goddamn movie. It's ridiculous. Um, okay, cool. Um, once we hit Norma Desmond, things get real dramatic and real crazy. First of all, Norma Desmond is almost like Dracula with the big, the big staircase going up her house. She lives in an ho old Hollywood mansion, but it feels like Dracula's castle, um, which is funny because this is sunny California and not sort of, you know, cloud covered Transylvania or whatever. But it's the same kind of thing. And Joe Gillis is poor, um, just like usually there's usually there's peasants in a Dracula movie and vampire is the rich guy who eats the peasants. Um, Dracula is a metaphor for rich feeding off the poor. Welcome to America. Um, so she's all, and she, she, she's this bizarre figure, right? She's this fascinating figure and you see her from up, up on high and she's like shouting commands at Max. Um, 
and it's spooky. I mean, there's a there's there, there's a, there's a coffin, and she's got these like wild glasses on. Her outfit is absolutely amazing. Um, again, just like Grace Kelly, and I think Gilda too. You see these big chunky bracelets. She has a lot of like brace heavy bracelet jewelry, um, and she wears leopard print, um, which is one of those great. It's a great. It's 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 the, it's still today. It's one of those things that hasn't changed at all. Wearing leopard print is a symbol of sort of outrageous feminine power. Um, leopard print is such a bold choice to wear, uh, and in her case, you got to wonder if it's actual fucking leopard. Um, but she, it's a it's a bold like it's an it's a dramatic animal skin, right? It's like a, like she's a hunter or something. Um, it's such a bold, wild choice, and and that hasn't changed. At all, you see somebody today wearing a leopard skin coat or a leopard skin skirt, and it, they're they're dramatic. They are fucking here for it. Um, and Norma Desmond is often featured in leopard print. In fact, one of my favorite details about the movie is her car, which becomes a big thing in the movie. But her car, the interior of the car is leopard print, which is such a wild detail. Um, again, is it real leopard? It fucking might be, given that it's Norma Desmond. Um, okay, cool. She's very intense eyes, too. You know, Norm, Norma Desmond rarely blinks. She sort of stares like this, and she's very intense, and her makeup's very dramatic, and she's fucking cool. Um, uh, Norma Desmond is a silent picture star. Now, this is something my students have a very hard time imagining, um, what Norma Desmond's problem is, but it is worth it to kind of stop for a hot second and think about it. Um, so Norma Desmond was a big deal 30 years ago, right? Because this movie takes place in 1950. But Norma Desmond was a movie star like in the 20s. Um, and films back then didn't have any sound. They were just pictures that moved. And they would often, and when you go to the movie theaters in the old days, there'd be music, but there'd be like an actual orchestra playing music. And the audience would watch a film that had no sound at all, no talking, no music, live music being played during the film. Um, because that's the only way they could do a soundtrack. Um, and it, it, it's hard to imagine people would do this um, because most of my students would not go see a, I, I, I make you watch old black and white movies and students are like, oh shit, I don't, I don't really like black and white movies. Try watching a movie with no soundtrack at all. It's a whole other experience, but it's neat to do that in New York City. Occasionally they'll have showings where people will do uh, silent movies live. The thing about Norma Desmond that makes her seem crazy is that she says, Movies were better before they had talking in them. Now, most of my students think any technological advance, they call it an advance, um, any change in technology is for the better. So they just, my students assume color movies are always better than black and white movies. New movies are always better than old movies. Movies with talking and sound must be better than silent movies because they had this idea that because they couldn't, they, first they couldn't do sound in movies, then they could. So obviously having the option is superior. First, they couldn't do color in movies, and then they could. So obviously color is superior. But I, I hope that you're discovering through this class with color, for example, it's not always superior. Um, some of my students were surprised to see some of the black and white movies that I had you guys watch. And they were like, well, shit, this black and white movie was like Night of the Hunter, for example, it was made in 1955. Could have been in color. They chose to make it in black and white. So it wasn't just, movies aren't black and white because it was all the only option they had. Black and white at some point became a choice. Um, Norma Desmond, and I think students can kind of learn to get on board with that. And they're like, shit, this is actually pretty good. I didn't, I never seen a black and white movie, but this is actually pretty cool. And it looks cool. The black and white is like a cool effect. Night of the Hunter would not be better in fucking color because it's about good versus evil, black versus white. It's cool. Um, but Norma Desmond's a little bit, Norma Desmond's situation is harder for my, for my students to grasp. Most people, and I, honestly, I'm a little bit in this camp too. I'm sympathetic. Um, it's hard to imagine the idea that a silent movie would be better than movies with talking. But Norma Desmond believes that they are. Um, and I, I think we should try to take her seriously a little bit. Um, she thinks that once they introduced talking into movies, they it ruined movies. Because really what it did is it ruined her career because she was a big deal when movies were silent. But when movies changed to talking, she, um, she was not able, like a lot of actors were not able to transition. They were used to doing one thing and they couldn't do the other. Um, 
then she got kind of left behind by Hollywood. She was a big deal when she was in silent movies, but there was no place for her in talking movies. And so she had made all of this money from silent film, and that's why she's rich. But she hasn't been in a movie in like 30 years because she doesn't do talkies. She wants to be in silent films, and they don't make those anymore. Um, and she she thinks they should never have they should never have put talking into movies. And Joe Gillis makes this joke about that's what the, that the talking the dialogue that he writes is so bad. That's what popcorn's for. It's for sticking in your ears. You don't have to listen to this terrible these terrible words. All right, I'll pick this up in the next video.